Right. Thanks. Um, <laughs> so how many engineers in this room would say that your favorite external department to work with is your marketing department? All right, that's a little more than I expected. I don't know, are you all just... All right. So I think that um, sometimes in our personal life we have problems with other people because we fail to have empathy for where another person is coming from. And I think that sometimes in tech we have problems empathizing with other departments and their perspective on things. I'm pretty sure that we all think that if left to their own devices, marketing would want the website <laughs> to look like that. And so this is not actually true. Marketing doesn't want this at all. Uh, what marketing wants to do is they want to bring in new customers, they want to help existing customers convert at higher rates, and they want to make us all lots of money and pay our paychecks. So we're actually all friends. We're all on the same side. But we do have some reasons why we are sometimes, as engineers, cautious about marketing. And I think one of those reasons is because the types of things that marketing wants to do on our websites are often not the kinds of things that we as engineers enjoy doing. So a simple pixel image pasted into a template of HTML could make a huge difference for a marketing person. It could break new business, it could bring in lots of incremental revenue. Uh, but for us as engineers, it's copy pasting an image into a page. And that's not why most of us get up in the morning. And also I think that uh, we have legitimate concerns about the effect of all of the third parties that are running on our site. We have concerns about the speed and the performance impact of all of those things. So I'm talking today about how to deal with all those things, and I'm talking from the perspective of e-commerce. I am an engineer at Guilt Group here in New York. We are a fashion e-commerce site. We do mostly flash sales, so we will take high-end designer overstock merchandise, we'll sell it at discounts, but for a limited time. So a particular brand, like this Prada brand here, will run for uh, several days or, or 36 hours, and then when the sale is over, the merchandise is no longer available. So not only do we have sort of a high-end experience in our visuals, but we also have this speed component making performance even more important to us. We want to help our customers to buy faster. But like a lot of e-commerce companies, we have a marketing department. And marketing does a lot of its work through the use of tags. So what's a tag? I'm sorry, this keeps coming loose. And I'm going to try to solve that problem. My ear's gonna like stick out like this. Um, so a tag is a piece of JavaScript or uh, maybe an iframe or maybe a simple pixel image that is put onto our web applications and deployed. And what it does is it talks to a third party. Maybe that's a marketing partner, maybe that's Google Analytics. Whatever it is, it's talking to some external uh, web server and telling it something about our customers, what they're interested in, what they're doing on the site, and gives us information. But there are a lot of these things sometimes on our site. And what will happen is that the marketing department will send an email and say, can you take this thing and can you paste it into the website? Uh, please tell me when it's live. Okay, thanks. Bye. So, and sometimes we just dutifully copy paste that thing. We hope it hasn't been like pasted from Microsoft Word or Skype and has some weird line breaks and stuff in it. Um, we put that into our site and we deploy it. Or in the case of Gilt, we have a micro application architecture, so we actually deploy maybe 20 applications. And so what happens then if we need to change this thing later on, or if it breaks and we need to remove it, we have to remove it from the page and we have to deploy 20 web applications. This is not a very sustainable way to live. And so you know, maybe you get on the phone with the tech department of the, uh, the third party vendor and you say, well, what about this thing? What is it? And the tech person says, oh no, don't worry, don't worry. It's one line of JavaScript. It's one line. <laughs> have we all heard that before? It's a single line of JavaScript, and it won't have any impact on your web performance. It's amazing. I'm pretty sure that nothing that your marketing department actually wants to do on the site can be done in one line of JavaScript, JS 1K competitions notwithstanding. Um, one line of JavaScript is probably bootstrapping potentially 300K of code that may or may not even be gzipped. So we need to actually look at these things. If you get this kind of a request, take the, the URL that you're sent, try to figure out what it's bootstrapping, and then go hit that in Chrome and look at your network tab like over and over again and see when the, you know, if, if you actually have every 10 requests takes 500 milliseconds or something. You can, you can try to investigate what's going on. But oftentimes this code is sort of obfuscated. It's sometimes hard to know what's happening in your code. And so I can't solve all those problems for you. Um, I can't solve the problems that sometimes this code is a little bit janky. Um, sometimes it's really good. There's some really great tag providers out there. But sometimes the tag code that we have 
uh, it doesn't really look like it's been touched a lot since 2005 or so. And they're trying to work in every single browser. And if they have a customer somewhere whose CEO still uses IE6, they're going to get phone calls if things break. And so th this code is very cautious sometimes. And, uh, and so we have a lot of it running in our sites, and we need to find a solution. So what can we do? One of the things we can do is we can implement a container tag or a tag container. The terms at this point, from what I can tell, are completely synonymous, um, just inverted. So what's a container tag? Instead of copying and pasting all of these pixels and all of these JavaScripts into our site, uh, what we can do is we can work with a vendor that sells one of these container tags, and we can deploy a single tag to our site. And that single tag then allows the remote injection of any number of arbitrary tags down into our customers' web browsers. So sort of a script injection framework for your marketing department. And so this is really, really cool, and it's also really scary at the same time. It's really cool because there's all this work now that we don't have to do. We don't have to copy-paste pixels. We don't have to deploy web applications. We don't have to freak out and try to get everything deployed if something breaks and we need to remove this thing. We can just go into a web dashboard, and we can check the tag, or we can uncheck the tag, and we can add and remove it very, very quickly. So it saves us a lot of work, but it also is really scary because we all of a sudden don't actually know what's running on our websites. So marketing has access to this dashboard, and they can add things in. And just like the Port Authority can't investigate every single crate that comes into a harbor, um, we can only spot check. We can't actually know everything that's coming down into our web applications. So how do these things work out of the box? I should probably just hold this thing. Um, uh, so what happens is uh, we use a company called Signal. You might have heard of Floodlight. You might have heard of Atlas, which has the UAT container. You might have heard of Tagman or Google Tag Manager, or I think Adobe has a product now too, I think. Um, we use a company called Signal. And the way Signal works out of the box is that there's this DOM binding thing going on. So Signal has a, a web dashboard. You log in, and you give it an event. You need to send an event to the tag container, and then the tag container responds by sending down client code. So the first step of this is an event. And the way Signal works is it expects a DOM element and a DOM event to happen. In this case, I'm using the example of Add to Cart for this talk, because we all know what Add to Cart is. So in this case, if we were following their documentation, we would type .add to Cart in this dashboard. And so what's wrong with this? Well, what's wrong with this is that in a year, someone's going to redesign the product detail page. And they're going to change the markup, and they're going to use something other than Add to Cart, because why not? They can. And they don't actually know that there's a dashboard somewhere in space listening for this particular event's uh, occurrence. So in that case, we lose all of our events, and we lose all of the marketing tags. But marketing is going to discover that maybe in a couple weeks when they're looking at their numbers. They're not going to notice that all of a sudden they've lost everything. And eventually, you're going to get an email saying, what happened? And you can't get that month of data back. And so you're going to have to scramble and try to figure out what's wrong. The other thing that can happen is that maybe we don't redesign the product detail page. Maybe we add a way on the search page to add to cart. And so that has different markup, maybe. It's quick add to cart. And so we're firing quick add to cart events. And so now we're siphoning users away from the product detail page and onto another place. And these numbers, instead of dropping off a cliff, kind of just kind of ease down over time as customers start using the new feature. That's even more insidious, because then marketing might not even notice right away. And you're potentially losing a lot of events that you would like to be capturing. So this doesn't work very well for creating events. The next thing we need to do after we've created an event, though, is we need to actually wire up a tag. So we could do one of these, or we could do 30 of them. If we're doing one, we probably shouldn't use a tag container. But we're probably not. We're probably doing several. And so you do that through the use of a web dashboard with a form. And this is some sort of random remarketing tag. I don't remember which one it is I picked off of our dashboard. And uh, the third party isn't actually interested that some random customer added a thing to their cart. They want to know who added something to their cart, what they added, and how many. I want to note as a sidebar, we don't send personally identifiable information to our third parties. We double hash our GUIDs. We don't send emails. So when I say we're sending a user ID, we're actually sending a hash of a user ID that's not traceable back to our users by the third party. So we need to know sort of the SKU and the price and the quantity. Where do we get all this information? Well, we can get all this information from markup. We're firing DOM events. So let's try that. Let's put uh, data attributes. That's what they're for. We'll put those on the uh, HTML that we are firing an event on. So the SKU, that works OK, because this is a server-generated page, and we have the SKU there. So that's fine. It's a product detail page. Uh, but then we have a quantity selector. And so the user is going to be selecting something from a select box to pick the quantity they want. And now we have to write JavaScript to dynamically update this uh, quantity data attribute with the quantity the user selected. 
What if the third-party dashboard is the only thing listening to this data attribute? Then when it breaks, you're not going to know that it breaks, and you're back to the same problem you have. So you have to write Selenium tests to see you know, if this connection is being made over time. And all of this is starting to feel really very duct taped together. Um, this is not a very, uh, it, it's, it is a very brittle way to live. In addition, we still need the user ID. We still need to know who this user is. So we have to actually have a global JavaScript object on our page that contains user data, and then the web dashboard can write some JavaScript to access that data. So this wasn't really working for me. Um, it felt very scary. It felt like something was going to break down the line, even if I successfully implemented it, I think, a couple, two years ago when we did this at first. So what I really needed to do was to actually enforce this thing. We have a web dashboard somewhere. It doesn't know anything about our code base. The two of them will never actually talk to each other in any meaningful way because there's no API here. And we need to actually somehow create a connection between the two. And the way that we did that is by using a custom element instead of keying off of the Add to Cart button. So the Signal dashboard expects a DOM element, so we're going to give it a DOM element. We're going to give it an Add to Cart attempt element just especially for it. And so that's the end game. That's where we're going. I'm going to step through how we actually get there. But in the end, we're actually going to be clicking a custom element specifically for this dashboard. So let's talk about how we get there. So the thing to remember first of all, is that adding to cart can happen from anywhere at Gilt. We, can have, we could add a, an add to cart from a modal somewhere. Um, theoretically, we don't actually have any limit to where we can add to cart. So you don't actually always want to do your tracking at the level of the DOM uh, element, unless that's actually what you're interested in. But in the case of add to cart, you actually want to find where all that code goes once you click add to cart. So Gilt has a client-side MVC cart. And there's a controller for that cart. And so what we can actually do is we can actually key into that. So somewhere in the system, anywhere in the system, someone could call this add to cart method. And when we call an add to cart method, it knows first class what we're adding. It knows the data. It knows how many things. It knows the price of those things, because we're actually having to tell the cart what we're adding. So we have real data here. And so walk with me into the cart controller. And so the cart controller actually is going to do a request down here. It's going to actually hit an endpoint, add something to the cart, and then when the promise resolves, it's going to actually update the UI and show the user that they've added something to their cart. So that's great. Why am I tracking on top of that? So I'm tracking before that happens, because for a third party, they're actually not terribly interested in whether the add to cart was successful or not. Um, the third party is actually interested that this user likes this product. If I've gone to the trouble to add it to my cart, I like it, and that's valuable information. So we actually often want to track at that level, even if there wasn't enough quantity and the cart ad wasn't successful. So that's why the attempt language is in here that you'll see in a couple slides. So we're going to call this thing called tracking.addToCart attempt. What is that thing? So early on at Gilt, what we were doing for third party tracking is that we were taking all of these third parties that we were talking to, and we were putting the calls to those third parties in our code all over the code base. And so you might have a cart controller that has a really clean add method, but then you're firing a, a Google Analytics call, and you're firing a floodlight call, and you're firing a sig signal call. That gets really ugly, because something that should read really nicely as a controller method is actually cluttered up with all these sort of implementation details from third party code that we actually don't care about. So. What we decided to do instead was to create tracking APIs specifically for each of our uh, NPM modules, including the cart. So every web application has a tracking module. Every NPM module can have a tracking module. You've all got tracking modules. And so uh, these are like a one-to-one -one kind of bound relationship. We could have put them in the same repo. We put them in a different repo for like code review purposes, because the data team actually wants to know. So putting them in a different repo is actually really clean for the people who have to actually review and make sure that these things are happening. And that's where the implementation details go for uh, all of these tracking things. So when, I, when it says tracking up here, that's actually the reference to the cart controller's tracking module. So what happens in this tracking module? Well, this is where we wrap up all the implementation details for these third parties. So the two examples here are Google Analytics and Signal. So Google Analytics wants a category and an action and a label. We all know how that works. Make sure that you two string the values, because GA won't fire the event if it's not a string. It'll just get lost. Um, and then after we fire GA and tell it the information we want, then we're calling this thing called Signal Fire Event. So what is Signal Fire Event? So 
I already said Signal didn't have an API. That's sort of a lie. Signal has begun building and has built an API. They did it mostly for mobile uh, devices. They're now adapting it for web use. We're experimenting with it, but it's not there yet. So they are, they are working toward this, but this was done when they did not have uh, that available to us. So because they don't have an API, this is not actually making a remote AJAX call. What it's actually doing instead is, well, the method is taking an event name, which is hyphenated, which should give you a clue that something might be happening here. Um, and then it's sending the data. And again, this is still first class data in the system. It's the SKU ID, it's the quantity. And so what actually happens in, in the code is that we are able to create a DOM element and then we are able to trigger a click on that DOM element. It is that simple. I mean, it's dead simple. It's, it's, um, that's all it is. And because of the fact that we are creating the DOM element and then we are triggering the click on it, the, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like These bindings are always going to work because we are making them at the point that we are creating this event. So this can't fail. And so now we have this third-party dashboard that is actually tied in a way that it didn't ever know that it was going to be tied to the front-end code base of our site. So this is great. We created a uh, very elegant, very future-proof API to fire events to something that we can't actually really fire events to. And so what did we do after this? We gave the marketing department full and complete access to the dashboard so they could do whatever they wanted to do. This is a true story. And so how, so how did we do something so risky? We, we did something so risky because we wanted to empower people to do their jobs. So we have a culture of, of empowerment at Gilt. We have a culture of autonomy. We don't want to micromanage people, and that goes for tech people as well as for marketing people. And so there was talk early on that maybe tech should be the gatekeeper for this thing. Maybe tech should run the signal dashboard, look at all the tags, copy-paste things in. And so that didn't feel very good because, first of all, we were trying to avoid copy-pasting things in the first place. So like whether it's an HTML file or whether it's a, a web dashboard, it's still doing that kind of work that it's going to go into a ticket, it's going to sit in JIRA, we're going to kind of hot potato pass it around at sprint planning because nobody really wants to do this stuff. And in a month, the marketing is going to say, what happened? And you're like, oh yeah, we were building this thing that was fun and we didn't, we didn't do your stuff. So this isn't, um, <laughs> this isn't a fun way to work. And so we didn't want to replicate that now that we had this new thing. And also then it works against the culture of autonomy that we're trying to create. So we empower people, but how can we empower people? Well, we can only empower people to do their jobs because we have accountability. And we only have accountability because we have monitoring. So I cannot stress enough the importance of third-party synthetic monitoring for anyone who has third-party integrations. You need to know what's going on in your site. If you're just copy-pasting code over into some sort of, even if you're using a tag container, you have no insight into how that thing's performing and how it's affecting your customers. So synthetic monitoring is great. Um, the difference between real user monitoring and synthetic monitoring, um, I sometimes hear the question, should I use RUM or should I use synthetic? And that's, the answer is yes. Like They do different things. Um, real user monitoring is an agent that lives in the web application and reports back the load data for absolutely every customer around the world. So that's big data. Um, and because of that, it's not extremely granular. It gives you averages for everything. Well, if you have cached page views and uncached page views, and you know some things are cached and some things are not, if something's performing badly and you have three page views per session, the, that's all averaged in, and your chart might not actually move that much, even though you have something really kind of bad happening on your first page view. Synthetic monitoring are instances that live in S3 data centers that you usually, that you give specific URLs to, and they go and they hit your site at those specific URLs um, at fixed intervals. For us, we use five minute intervals, and we hit like, I don't know, 20 URLs. And it, they actually then collect the data for every HTTP request that's made in that page cycle. So that gives you incredibly granular insight into how third parties are performing and how your own site is performing. So that lets us have a chart like this. This is from New Relic Synthetics. New Relic has a synthetic product now. Um, we also use Rigor for synthetic monitoring. Some people use Catchpoint. The, um, so this is an example from New Relic. And what I've done is I have to write some New Relic query language. NRQL, it's, it's pretty cool. 
Um, you have to write queries to find this stuff out right now. Um, but once you do, you can look at every domain that is loaded through Signal, for example, and you can see how it's performing. So you can look and see that uh, you know, the, the blue bar at the bottom is adnexus.com. And so they're kind of not performing great. They're kind of the worst. This is stacked in, in order of uh, load time. But they also had a pretty bad day there for a while and had a little bit of a spike. And so you can see that spike, and you can look at it, and you can see if it, per if it continues or if it drops back down. And so if that had continued, then we would have a chart, and we could go to marketing, and we could turn off the tag in the dashboard. And we could also then send an email to the vendor, and we could say, look, your tag is doing this to our site. Data gives you power. Like, it's, it's an impartial referee. It's just telling you what's happening. So instead of having this sort of weird relationship with marketing um, where they want you to do something and you don't because you're worried about performance, you have a chart that's telling you exactly what's happening. And you can go to vendors, and you can say this isn't acceptable. Or you can decide that it is acceptable, depending on what your business is and, and how important this thing is. And so also I want to call out the people at the top that are doing really well. Google ad services, double click and add this. Um, those are just those very steady, thin lines at the top. They're doing almost no impact on our clients, and they don't have any spikes in them. So they're performing really well. So this data is incredibly powerful. And it lets us look at things in an individual way like this, where we can look at every domain. But it also lets us look in the aggregate, because synthetic monitoring is not what your customers are seeing. You give it the URL, which means you can use a query parameter, and you can actually say, what would the site look like with no marketing? We'd all like to know that, wouldn't we? And so you can see what the site would look like with no marketing. And you can see the diff between that page load. It's about a, it's about a second and a change there. So that's the impact of the third parties on your customers. And you can decide collectively if that's an acceptable differential. And you can also see if that diff changes over time. You can even set up reports and get emails if that suddenly you know, increases by an amount that you don't feel that you can live with. So synthetic monitoring is, is what allows us to actually empower people to do all this stuff with the third party tag container. So I've just spent some time talking about things that you don't want to do, really. Like, does, any of, does anyone think that the ideal is that in 10 years we're still going to be shoving like, massive amounts of code down to browsers and dropping third party cookies and doing all this ugliness? Like, we're living in 2005. We're just trying to find a good way to do it. And so I, nobody wants to be there. There is a future. And the future is instead of this container ship model going across the ocean with all these crates of stuff that we don't know what it is, it's much more of a 3D printer kind of model. It's like, let's take the data that we need, let's ship it to an endpoint, and then let's do all the assembly of all these tags and stuff on the server. And so Signal has a product to do that. I, I assume the other providers have this as well, where they will become partners with certain vendors, and they will get server direct integrations going. And that's great, because all we have to do on the client, we still have to drop the third-party cookie because nobody can let go of the third-party cookie. But after we do that, we can send, that's relatively cheap compared to all this other stuff that we're doing. Um, and it only has to be done once. It doesn't have to be done on every single page view. And so after we do that, we can send a data for an add to cart event to Signal. And Signal can hook up with 100 partners, as many as marketing can keep track of. They can send stuff everywhere. And we don't care, because it doesn't affect our front end performance at all. So that's where we're going. That's the future. It's hard, though, because uh, some vendors have done really well with this. Yahoo has really good server direct integration. Um, small companies have a little more trouble with it, because they have to actually get together with all of these different vendors, and they have to create create server direct integrations. Like, they have to do something. So small companies often don't have the bandwidth to do that. And the large companies, honestly, I think they realize that they don't need to yet. Uh, Facebook, for example, doesn't want to do server direct integrations. And I think that they're just big enough that they know that we have no choice. So uh, you know, we're kind of stuck with the old fashioned style uh, injection into the client with the large companies. So, this is exciting, this is the future, but we're not there yet. So as long as we're not in that future, what you can do is you can use a tag container to send code down to your clients. And that will allow you, and you can also use synthetic monitoring, and you have to use synthetic monitoring to know how it's performing. And that will allow you to check in on these things, to know what's happening, to have the nimbleness to turn these things on and off quickly without deploys if they aren't performing well, to have the data that you need to communicate to third parties to push them to make them perform better. And then you also get to free engineers from having to do all this stuff that they don't want to do anyway. And you get to empower your marketing department to do their jobs faster and better. So thank you very much, and I look forward to answering questions in the lounge. Thank you.